Now, please welcome to the stage AERA President Joyce E. King. Welcome to the third annual awards luncheon where we will recognize and honor the outstanding scholarship and service of our peers. I would like to thank the major sponsors of this luncheon, American Institutes for Research, Georgia State University College of Education, and the silver sponsors, Michigan State University College of Education, University of Georgia College of Education, University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education, University of Southern California Rossier School of Education, Vanderbilt University Peabody College, William T. Grant Foundation. And could we revisit the Georgia State College of Education and just say thank you? Now we would like to take this time to recognize our outgoing editors and thank them for all of their hard work. And could you hold your applause until the end and we'll congratulate them all. Vivian Gadsden, educational researcher. Cineray, Sandip Cineray, Journal of Education and Behavioral Science Statistics. Matthew Scott Johnson, Journal of Educational and Behavioral Statistics, Zeus Leonardo, Review of Educational Research, Kristen J. Faltus, Review of Research in Education, Jamal Abedi, Review of Research in Education. Thank you for your hard work. And at this point in the program, we will now take uh, a moment to recognize our colleagues who have passed away in the last year. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. We will now wish to celebrate the awardees from this year. I would like to introduce the um, Early Career Award. I'm honored to represent the Early Career Awards Committee for this year. Did you know that race is a common topic of online conversation among adolescents and that adolescents are frequently exposed to racial epithets in the course of these conversations? Did you know that these types of online experiences negatively influence adolescent adjustment offline? Did you know that these experiences with racial discrimination predict psychological distress, such as anxiety and depression among youth? These are the incredibly important issues to which Dr. Brandisha Tynes, this year's recipient of the AERA Early Career Award, is contributing through her scholarship. But Dr. Tynes is not just describing this situation, She's also pursuing the coping strategies that adolescents deploy to manage the negative outcomes that are typically associated with online victimization. Her research is, unfortunately, timely. It is powerful in the sense that she's generating tools and methods for the use of the broader educational and social science communities. It is influential because her recent writing is featured in both professional and popular venues. It's practical in the sense that it has immediate implications for practice. In short, it's well deserving of this special recognition. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Brandisha Times.
Thank you. I want to thank God for this day and for my wonderful family who drove all the way from Detroit to be here. <clears throat> I want to thank our president, Dr. King, and the awards committee, um, to Drs. Chris Gutierrez and Helen Neville. Thank you for your support and being such an amazing example of the possibilities. I want to also thank my first mentor, Dr. Carol Lee who helped me to frame my thinking around uh, culture as an asset that could be used to promote positive academic, emotional, and academic outcomes. So in my research, when we found that, uh, well, what can only be described as pre-civil rights era race relations, where youth of color are denigrated sometimes on a daily basis, I wondered how might their culture and having a strong sense of themselves serve as a buffer against the negative outcomes typically associated with these experiences. This is an, this is an important question, particularly for black youth um, who may see uniquely disparaging representations of themselves as animals and a constant questioning of their humanity and their intelligence. As my research focuses more on blended and personalized learning in schools, I'm interested in how teachers and students develop positive racial ethnic identities with technology. How can we help youth develop a lens to counter and critique uh, the dominant messages that they receive and ultimately empower them to design their own digital tools um, as in these efforts? I accept this award as a charge and feel beyond inspired for this next phase of my research. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Presenting the Palmer O. Johnson Award, George W. Bornstead. Good afternoon. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Palmer O. Johnson Award is given to uh, an AER uh, article that uh, exhibits the highest levels of scholarship. Uh, Matthew Kraft and John Pepe present solid empirical evidence that the professional environment that teachers experience can result in improved student performance. Using data from a large urban district the authors link teachers' responses to a survey and show that after controlling for student, peer, and school-level covariates, the mathematics performance of students with teachers who experience an orderly, supportive, and collaborative school environment perform better than students who have teachers who don't have such a supportive environment. These results suggest the importance of instituting policies that build supportive professional communities and engagements for students for, in schools as a way to improve teacher effectiveness. I'm very pleased to make this award. Thank you very much, AERA. John and I are honored and thrilled. And of course, we'd like to first thank our families, our little kiddos, Jack and Rose, and my little son, Dylan, and uh, my dad, who drove up from St. Louis to be here today. And uh, we'd also like to recognize the huge impact that our mentors at the Harvard Ed School had, Dick Murnain, uh, an amazing man, an amazing scholar, really helping to pave the way for us and, and, and help us to set out on the adventure and, and research agenda that we've carved out. And in addition, Susan Moore Johnson, who 
is over there and we'd really like to recognize to help us to truly understand what's happening inside schools on the ground, getting an understanding of relationships among teachers, relationships and interactions between teachers and their students. And, you know, John and I were both high school humanities teachers and one thing I know for sure in this uncertain world of academic research is that being inside a classroom teaching on a daily basis is by far the hardest professional experience that I've ever had and that it's far harder than this world of academia which I'm privileged to be in right now. And, you know, that experience has really shaped our own research agenda and what was clear to us in the classroom was that despite our best efforts that our environment really shaped our opportunities to succeed with our students and to grow as professionals. And that's what our research has attempted to understand. And it turns out that that seems to be true for a large swath of the 3.5 million teachers out there today in classrooms. And so we really urge folks to invest in the teachers in classrooms today to help them develop their skills and move forward. Thanks very much for this recognition. Presenting the Review of Research Award, Larry V. Hedges. Uh, one thing I like about coming to this meeting uh, is that it reminds me uh, that there are enough people to fill a room this big who are still dedicated to the fight for social justice. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, one of, the thing, one of the reasons I love AERA. It's probably one of the reasons you love AERA. Uh, we're reminded, though, that the fight for social justice is never over. Uh, it has shifting battlegrounds and shift, that require shifting tactics and different ways of approaching the threats to social justice that we see emerging. One of the battlegrounds in which we all fight uh, is the judicial system, and one of the aspects of that battle is the, are, sur, involves issues of social justice surrounding language. I'm very pleased that our committee decided to make this award to Jeannie Powers because her work has given us new tactics to fight for social justice around language issues and has given us a chance to be a little bit ahead of the curve in analyzing the way in which judicial thinking uh, has occurred and can be exploited in our quest for social justice. So I'm very pleased uh, to be able to give this award to Jeannie Powers. Um, so I'd like to, I'm very honored to receive this award, so I'd like to thank um, the awards committee, first of all, and um, what I mostly want to do with my time is to really thank the people that have helped me along the way, because as scholars, we get these awards as individuals or as research teams, but we really stand on the shoulders of many people that have supported us in our careers in small and large ways. And so first, I want to thank the ed editors of RRE, Catherine Borman, Arnie Danzig, David Garcia, and Terry Wiley, who gave me the opportunity to extend my research on school segregation and think about it through the frame of language rights. At ASU, Jean Glass and David Berliner really nurtured my career there, and Gustavo Fishman has been a wonderful friend and colleague. I'd also like to thank Dean Mary Kerner, who has created a space that allows us as scholars to thrive as, that has created a space that has allowed us to thrive as scholars at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. I'd also like to thank Dean Ida Malian for the time, care, and energy she puts into mentoring us as faculty members and developing our careers. Finally, I'd like to thank my husband, Carl Hermans, for his love, support, and companionship. Thank you. Presenting the Outstanding Book Award, Gary G. Nadriello.
It's um, my great pleasure to um, introduce you to the Outstanding Book Award and the Outstanding Book, the School Society, on behalf of the Outstanding Book Award Committee. And I'd like to just introduce you a bit to the author of the award, David, uh, of the book, David Baker, who invites us to think about education in a much fuller way as a dominating force in our society, every bit as important as deliberative democracy or large-scale capitalism. And in the book, David makes the case that paying attention to the education that exists everywhere around us in a much more systematic and fulsome way uh, will get a, give us a gr much greater appreciation of its impact um, on our lives and the lives of those across the world. On behalf of the committee, I'm very happy to introduce Dave Baker. Thank you, Gary. Never ever write a book over seven years. Not only does it take a long time, the number of people you have to thank grows exponentially. I'll start with the first one, and that is my absolute favorite, sociologist of ed education and the mother of my children, Mary Ellen Schaub. Thank you very much. Thank you to the uh, ARA. Uh, I want to also thank uh, David Monk, the dean at Penn State, and my colleagues at Penn State. I had very generous support from the National Science Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, and the Wissenschaft Centrum in Berlin as well. When you write a book like this, I found myself having various colleagues on my shoulder and having long discussions with them about what they would think about what I was writing. And these were very important, a little crazy, but very important. And I want to thank all of those people. There's too many to mention here right now. I'd also like to thank two of my mentors. Gerald Lenhart, the late Gerald Lenhart, who just passed away, is a German sociologist of education. And John Meyer, who is a sociologist of education at Stanford. Uh, Gary summed up the book better than I could, so I won't. Uh, but thank you all, and thank you all for coming to the lunch. Thank you. Presenting the Scholars of Color in Education Awards, Kimberly Gomez. It is with great pleasure that I introduce the Committee on Scholars of Color in Education Early Career Awardee for 2015, Dr. Ebony McGee. Ebony is leading the way in our understanding of the role of stereotypes and other influences in the post-secondary career and academic decision-making of high-achieving African-American, Asian, and Latino STEM students. In her extensive research, McGee explores stereotype management using one's awareness of others' negative stereotypes as motivation to not only achieve, but to excel. It is not surprising that her dissertation on this subject, Race, Identity, and Resilience, Black College Students Negotiating Success in Mathematics and Engineering, received AERA's Division G Outstanding Dissertation Award in 2010. In a three-year NSF-sponsored research study, Ebony explored the experiences and academic and career decisions of 61 STEM, Black, Latino, and Asian students, advanced undergraduate college students, who were expected to realize their ambitions in those fields. Her overall aim was to undercover the factors and considerations impacting the academic and career decisions of these students, and to understand more about how their decisions have been shaped by prior, sometimes racialized experiences. Ebony is especially interested in why some high achieving students, despite completing a rigorous STEM education, seek careers outside these fields. Ebony is an assistant professor of diversity and urban schooling at Vanderbilt's Peabody College and a member of the Scientific Careers Research and Development Group at Northwestern University. 
She received her PhD in mathematics education from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and she was a National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation postdoctoral fellow and a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow. Ebony is a formal electric, formal, uh, electric engineer who trained at North Carolina A&T, an HBCU known for its remarkable nurturing and support of minority technical and engineering students. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Ebony O. McGee, Early Career Award winner. When I first entered the doctoral program at the University of Illinois at Chicago, I was full of shame and guilt. People who I cared about a great deal told me that I had achieved the American dream. After all, I was raised on the south side of Chicago and I had risen to the rank of being a practicing engineer at a Fortune 50 company. However, Everybody was dreaming except me. On one side of my identity, I had folks like my dad, Dr. Lau Shebi Khan, and my brother, Pei Kuhn, another doctor at Chicago State University, who every day uplifted and affirmed me. And on the other side, I had the STEM industry, my job, the conferences that I attended, who in every day, in every way, let me know that I did not belong. And now to be able to do the research that I do, I'm not only speaking for my voice, but I'm also speaking for other STEM students who are brilliant, but are literally dying to succeed. And as we problematize success, we need to understand what are the costs, what are the toxic psychological costs that we're asking our students to endure by being high achieving in STEM. And I'm fortunate enough to do this work looking at identity and resilience because after all, as Amanda Lewis told me, you cannot do identity and resilience without looking at the work of Dr. Margaret Bill Spencer. And I'm able to look at math identity, Danny Martin and Paul Cobb and others in the STEM field but I'm also suggesting that we need to uh, better understand the structural uh, influences that don't allow our students to achieve at the levels that they need to achieve in, in the STEM industry. Thank you so much to the committee. Thank you. I'm also pleased and honored to introduce the Scholars of Color in Education Distinguished Scholars Award to Dr. Kevin K. Kumashiro. <laughs> Professor Kumashiro is currently the Dean of the School of Education at the University of San Francisco. He is a leading expert on educational policy, school reform, teacher preparation, and educational equity and social justice. Prior to joining the faculty and administration at the University of San Francisco, Dr. Kumashiro was the primary investigator and project director of the University of Illinois at Chicago Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander Serving Institutions Initiative, which was funded by the U.S. Department of Education. This important program provided two-year grants to support the recruitment, retention, and academic success of Asian American, Pacific Islander, and English language learner students in higher education, and to improve academic programs, institutional management, and fiscal stability. At UIC, Dr. Kumashiro also served as professor and coordinator of the Asian American Studies Program. He was chair of the Department of Educational Policy Studies and interim co-director of the Institute for Research on Race and Pol Public Policy. Dr. Kumashiro is the past president of the National Association for Multicultural Education and is a founding member of the Chicago Research, Chicagoland Researchers and Advocates for Transformative Education, which produces research briefs and organizes public events that aims to reframe the debate on public school reforms in Chicago. 
He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Mid-Career Scholar Award from AERA's Teaching and Teacher Education Division, the 2014 Engage Scholar Award from the Association for Asian American Studies, the 2014 Distinguished Scholar Award from AERA's Research on Education of Asian and Pacific Islanders, SIG, and the 2015 Charles DeGarno Lecture Award for the Society of Professors of Education. Dr. Kumashiro is also an award-winning author and editor of 10 books on education and social justice, and he has written groundbreaking articles in leading education journals on anti-oppressive education. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Kumashiro, Distinguished Scholar, Awardee. Thank you, I'm really humbled to receive this award. I wanted to um, thank three groups of people. One is the Kim Gomez and the Committee on Scholars of Color, um, partly for your really exceptional choice for an awardee this year, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but more importantly, for doing the incredibly important work of really remaking the profession into a different kind of profession, us creating a space where those of us who are trying to do really important work can really find support. I'm remembering when I was a graduate student and many of us were kind of wondering, can you do research that's really about, that is really linked hand in hand with the kind of activist and advocacy work that we care most about, particularly for communities that struggle the most. And to be receiving a Distinguished Scholar Award um, for this kind of work, I think really opens the door for many more generations of scholars to see that it is possible to do that. Um, the second group that I wanted to thank are my mentors and particularly those who nominated me for this award. And I, I see Christine Sleeter and Francisco Rios. I see Christine Ye in particular. These are scholars who are really redefining what it means to do scholarship in ways that's really in solidarity with the communities that struggle the most. Um, I hope that my work can live up to the kind of example that they're setting for what is impactful scholarship in education. And finally, I see my community back there of the University of San Francisco, colleagues and friends. I've been asked a lot what it's like to be a new dean. And I have to say, I feel incredibly fortunate to be at an institution where collectively we are trying to make a different kind of institution. We're trying to act collectively to leverage all at our disposal to make the world a better place, particularly for those who struggle the most. Um, I hope that these are the kinds of institutions we build throughout our nation, and I look forward to working with many more of you to try to make that into a reality. Thank you very much. And finally, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Patricia Gandara, a scholar who I feel certain is quite familiar to all assembled here today. Dr. Gandara is the co-director of the Civil Rights Project at UCLA and is a professor at UCLA in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. Over many years, Dr. Gandara has built a record of expertise at the intersection of educational equity, bilingual and multicultural education, particularly with respect to examination of restrictive language policies and educational policy and reform. In recognition of her expertise and importance to the field, Dr. Gandara was appointed to President Obama's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for Hispanics, where she serves as the commissioner. Among her many accomplishments, Professor Gandara has directed education research and in the California legislature. She has also served as the commissioner for post-secondary education for the state of California and chaired the University of California Linguistic Minority Research Institute nationally Dr. Gandara has served as a past president of the Sociology of Education Association. She's also a fellow of the American Educational Research, Research Association and was a recipient of its, of its presidential citation at the 2011 AERA Annual Conference. Dr. Gandara has also been chair of the AERA Program C Committee 
uh, the, excuse me, the Program C Committee, and also the Chair of the Committee for Division G and the Chair of Hispanic SIG of AERA. In 2005, she was awarded the Distinguished Public Service Award from UC Davis and the Outstanding Researcher in Higher Education Award from the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Ed. Internationally, Professor Gandara chairs the University of California's Mexico Working Group on Education, a University of California system-wide group dedicated to forging ongoing and closer ties with Mexico around shared issues in education. She is a past fellow at the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center in Bellagio, Italy, and at the Educational Testing Service in Princeton. Professor Gandara has written or edited seven books and more than 100 articles and reports on educational equity for racial and linguistic minority students, school reform, access to higher ed, the education of Latino students, and language policy. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Gandara, Distinguished Career Awardee. Thank you. I don't believe anyone does the, the work that we do for the accolades, but I have to admit it is sweet to be acknowledged by your peers in this way. Thank you very much for the honor. I thought of all the people I owe thanks to, and that list is very, very long. In fact, it's too long. I've been fortunate to have many wonderful colleagues and mentors. So I apologize beforehand for not naming people individually. So fundamentally, I think I'm here because of the commitment of one generation of people who built great public schools, both all the way from kindergarten through higher education, for the generation that followed them and allowed kids like me, low income, working class, children of immigrants, to get a world-class education. I also know I would not be here if I hadn't been given the opportunity to sit next to kids who had the social capital that I lacked, who knew how to navigate the education system, and who brought me along with them. Unfortunately, that sense of commitment seems to have slipped away over time. And too many kids today, kids who are like me, no longer have these opportunities. It's this knowledge of how much I owe that motivates my work. Thank you for suggesting that maybe I've been on the right track. Presenting the Distinguished Contributions to Gender Equity and Education Research Award, Susan B. Twombly. The winner of the 2015 Distinguished Contributions to Gender Equity Award is Dr. Cheryl Shakeshaft, professor in the Department of Educational Leadership at Virginia Commonwealth University. She has many, uh, a list of many accomplishments, and I'm not going to read them here, but I just wanted to say a couple words. Cheryl earned her doctorate at Texas A&M in 1979 in research planning and evaluation by studying a topic she was told she was not allowed to study women in school leadership, or rather, the lack thereof. This act of scholarly bravery resulted in her pathbreaking book, Women in Educational Leadership, that documented the lack of women in education administration preparation programs and in school leadership positions, and the barriers confronting them. Her book changed the field, opening the door for other scholars to study women in school leadership. Collectively, this scholarship has provided inspiration and opened doors for generations of women to assume leadership positions in our nation's schools. In more recent work, Cheryl has taken on another forbidden but important topic, sexual misconduct in schools. She's published more than 90 articles and made far more presentations than I can count that have contributed to a national and international reputation. But publication alone is inadequate to describe Cheryl's comp, uh, contribution to the field. 
As one of her nominators said, Cheryl is a researcher who translates analysis into action for social justice. She is committed to understanding inequality in order to provide alternatives to existing practice. The women in the field of educational administration today, as professors, superintendents, and principals, are in these positions in no small way because Cheryl dared to take on research she was told she was not allowed to do. Thank you, Dr. Cheryl Shakespeare. Thank you, AARA. Thank you to the committee that selected me. And thank you to many people who I just want to name very quickly. Susan was right. When I started my doctoral work in 1975 to study women, I was told I couldn't, and I couldn't get a dissertation with it. I did. When I got my first position, I was told that if I studied women, I'd never get tenure. Poof. I was then told I couldn't get move up to full professor if I continued to study women. Ha! Huh. <laughs> and so what I want to say to you, and, and many of us are already there, what I want to say to the junior people in, the, in, in our association is that you can do what you want to do. Just do it. So I want to thank the uh, National Science Foundation and the U.S. Department of Education for funding my work, uh, even if I had to call it something else. Um, I want to thank my dean, Chris Walther Thomas, at uh, VCU for supporting me, and all of my colleagues at Hofstra and VCU who over time have supported me. I want to thank the SIG on the Research for Women in Education, who made it possible for me to have a home as a young researcher uh, when other areas might not have been so uh, welcoming. I want to thank Division A that changed very much and is now a very supportive division for women and for folks of color. Um, I really want to thank the students I had, all 127 of them whose dissertations I chaired for helping me stretch myself. And at a personal level, I'd like to thank Selma Greenberg, an early mentor who's not with us today. And I'd like to thank my family, my husband, Dale Mann, who's always supported me and suggested I move forward. And my daughter, Emma Shakeshaft, who attended her first AERA when she was four months old and called me up when she was in her first year of college to say, Mom, this is the first year I won't be at AERA. Array, but she's here today. Thank you. Presenting the Social Justice in Education Award, Estella M. Benzeman. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the 2015 award winner of the Social Justice in Education. The person that I'm about to introduce really needs no introduction. Gloria Ladson Billings is the, she was our president in 2005, six. She's currently at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where she holds the Kellner Family Professor of Urban Education. Gloria Ladson Billings has focused exclusively on equity and equality for racially and socially marginalized students. She has introduced us to new language, including the culturally relevant pedagogy. And she also has done research in which students of color are seen as inherently deficient for research that interrogates race as a central dynamic of oppression that is manifested in structural systems of institutional racism. I want to conclude my brief introduction by quoting Chris Gutierrez and her description of Gloria. She says, Gloria is force. She's brilliant, an activist, and fiercely committed to doing consequential research. The sisters got it all. I want to first thank my family, my husband Charles, my children, and my grandchildren for allowing me both the freedom and the space to do this work. 
I also want to thank all of my colleagues across the country and around the world, but I specifically want to thank those at the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where we actually have scholar athletes. Um, and, and a special thank you to my dean who is concluding 10 years of amazing leadership, Julie Underwood. I also want to thank AERA's Social Justice Action Committee. And I want to thank President Joyce King, who has been a friend, a mentor, and a colleague for more years than either of us is willing to admit. But there's something incredibly bittersweet about accepting this award when over the past year we have lost Professor William Watkins of the University of Illinois Chicago, the former chair of the AERA Social Justice Action Committee, Professor Richard Ruiz of the University of Arizona, AERA's first social justice officer, Professor Greg Dimitriadis of the University of Buffalo, a true champion of justice, Dennis Carlson, who was a leader in curriculum theory and gender and sexuality studies, and the great Maxine Green. I think this award, more than any I've received in AERA, best reflects my values and why I entered academic life. If there is any place <clears throat> where education can and should make a difference, it is in the service of real justice. It is a reminder that our work is not separate from issues of the economy, politics, housing, health, or criminal justice. And it is this last issue, criminal justice, that weighs heavy on my heart these days. Losing young lives like Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown Jr., Rakia Boyd, Jordan Davis, Tamir Rice, and Tony Terrell Robinson, or even older lives like Eric Garner and Walter Scott do not give me the luxury of distance through academics. The fact that our, company, our country imprisons more than 2.3 million people is the shame of the nation. And according to Byron Stevenson, the collateral consequences of mass incarceration have been equally profound. We ban poor women and inevitably their children from receiving food stamps and public housing if they have prior drug convictions. We have created a new caste system that forces thousands of people into homelessness and bans them from living with their families and in their communities and renders them virtually unemployable. Social justice in education must reach deeply into these issues so that those who might pursue education as a career will understand that our call is not merely to the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also to the fourth R of right. We are obligated to commit ourselves to the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, quoting Theodore Parker, declared, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but ultimately it bends towards justice. Again, thank you to the Social Justice Action Committee for this recognition. Thank you to AERA for making a space for scholars who are committed to justice. Presenting the E. F. Lindquist Award, Lee Kai. The E.F. Lindquist Award was established to honor a distinguished scholar and researcher for outstanding research in the field of educational testing and measurement. The 2015 recipient of the E.F. Lindquist Award is Dr. Howard Weiner, distinguished research scientist at the National Board of Medical Examiners. Dr. Weiner has authored, co-authored, or edited 22 books or volumes on a wide variety of topics related to educational measurement. Among these are widely read and cited treatises on technical topics such as testlet response theory and its applications, test scoring, comp computerized adaptive testing, differential item functioning, test validity, and principles of modern psychological measurement. Um, Dr. Weiner uh, also worked on graphical displays, graphical data analysis, robust statistics, and rational statistical thinking that he was able to translate these very difficult topics into language appreciated by many. 
Dr. Weiner received his PhD from Princeton in 1968 and served as a faculty member at the University of Chicago, which is just down south. Um, how, Dr. Weiner uh, indeed also influenced many junior colleagues throughout his careers, myself included, and the field is indeed fortunate to have witnessed and benefited from Dr. Weiner's talent, contributions, intellectual leadership. Well, I stand before you in humility and trepidation. The trepidation is because I have been listening to other people's remarks and I hadn't prepared anything. Uh, and, and, and so as I stood to get to, to come up here, my wife whispered to me, remember uh, the, the, the bywords of, of, of modern architecture, less is more. But she also knows that I tend to blur the distinction between scholarship and stand-up. Uh, and so, Mies Verndevo and Linda Steinberg to the contrary, Linda's my wife, uh, uh, I, I'm gonna go on. Uh, specifically, while I have a great many people to thank, uh, Linda first, uh, I, 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 I I want to echo, I guess, George S. Kaufman said that um, on the value of collaboration, he said that collaboration is guilt by association. <laughs> okay. uh, the, the two Jews in the audience seem to... <laughs> All right. Uh, but I, I have benefited from, from my collaborators enormously. Uh, and, and I'm very pleased to get this award. I did want to point out two things. First, uh, I wish I had gotten it 40 years ago uh, because it would have made my life a lot easier if I had gotten some career achievement award when I was 30. <laughs> it, I, I would have gotten promoted faster. I would have gotten grants more easily. But it, it just didn't happen because of the lack of wisdom of this society. It, it reminds me of uh, the 25th high school reunion I went to in which we were all walking around wearing buttons with pictures of ourselves from our senior yearbook. And I thought, my goodness, it would have been much more helpful when we were seniors if we could have had pictures of what we were going to look like 25 years later. <laughs> but alas, that hasn't happened. Thank you all very much. And especially, thank you, Linda. Presenting the Distinguished Public Service Award, David H. Monk. The American Educational Research Association's Distinguished Public Service Award is given in recognition of the contributions of those who have worked to enact or implement policies that are well grounded in educational research. Dr. Joseph Conaty is an exceptionally worthy recipient of the 2015 Distinguished Public Service Award from AERA. He is currently a policy advisor to the Deputy Secretary in the U.S. Department of Education. The Deputy Secretary is responsible for the Department's elementary and secondary education programs and many of its management functions. Dr. Conaty joined the U.S. Department of Education in 1987 as a visiting scientist. Over the last two and a half decades, he has served in various high-level roles, including the Acting Director of the Office of Research, the Director of the National Institute on Student Achievement, Curriculum, and Assessment, the Director of the Academic Improvement and Teacher Quality Program, and the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. During his federal career, he has worked on many of the department's research-based programs, including the Comprehensive School Reform Demonstration Program. More recently, Dr. Conaty was responsible for managing a number of the Recovery Act programs, including the State Fiscal Stabilization Program and Race to the Top. In addition to his work at the department, Dr. Conaty continues to serve as a lecturer in the Stanford and Washington program, where he teaches educational policy. 
Dr. Conaty received his PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1977 and served as a tenured associate professor at the University of Utah. <clears throat> Beginning in 1984, he spent two years at the University of Chicago as a visiting faculty member teaching statistics to graduate students, and his publications on statistics, education, and organizations have appeared in such journals as the American Statistician, the Journal of Business Research, Social Forces, and the Journal of Social Psychology and Demography. In view of all of these accomplishments, it is a special privilege for me on behalf of AERA to present the 2015 Distinguished Public Service Award to Dr. Joseph Conaty. Joseph. I would like to briefly say two things. One, thanks to the association for the very fact of creating such an award. I don't know of any other professional association that recognizes public service. The second thing is I would like to thank, and if I could do it, I would do it individually, to each and every one of the members of the association for your dedication, compassion, advocacy, in applying intelligence and research to improve the lot of each and every child in this nation. Thank you very much for this honor. Presenting the Distinguished Contributions to Research and Education Award, Chandra Muller. Distinguished Contributions to Research and Education Award is given to honor a meritorious contributor to educational research. Its purpose is to publicize, motivate, encourage, and suggest models for educational research at its best. The committee con considered impressive nominations of some of our field's finest and most meritorious scholars. We had a rich discussion about the breadth and importance of educational research and faced a difficult choice. In the end, we agreed that this year's recipient truly stood out for his distinguished and enduring contributions to educational research. Andrew Porter is among the most productive, original, and influential research leaders of our time. His numerous letters made a strong case that he has had made a major impact on education research through his own scholarship, leadership of research enterprises, mentorship, and national service. He is past president of AERA. He has been a member of the National Academy of Education since 1994 and has served as its vice president. He is a lifetime National Association of the National Academies and is an inaugural fellow of the AE, an inaugural AERA fellow. He is the George and Weiss Professor of Education at University of Pennsylvania, where he was formerly dean. He has directed the Learning Sciences Institute at Vanderbilt and the Wisconsin uh, Center for Education Research at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. His research contributions include sophisticated methodological approaches and transformative studies uh, on the content of instruction, student assessment, the quality of teacher professional development, and educational leadership. His impact has extended beyond the academy to policy, practice, and a public understanding of some of the most important issues in education today. On behalf of the committee, it's my pleasure to give this award 2015 to Andy Porter. Uh, 
thank you very much, uh, AERA, for this recognition of my research. Uh, uh, I tell you, I've, I've had great fun uh, doing it, and uh, this is a very great honor uh, to get this recognition. Um, of course, I have a lot of places and people to thank. I'll, I'll start with uh, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, our new dean, Pam Grossman, uh, kind enough to sponsor a table. I see many of my colleagues and friends there. Uh, the university that I was at before that was Vanderbilt University, and I see my dean from those days, Camilla, over there, and before that, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and starting my career at Michigan State University. All great universities. I love each one. In fact, I had Wisconsin playing MSU in the final game. I got it half right. I had Wisconsin winning. I got it all wrong. <laughs> I want to thank uh, 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 my funders uh, over the years and currently uh, uh, Insti for Educa Institute for Education Sciences and its uh, predecessors, uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, in the U.S. Department of Education, the Office of Evaluation, uh, and Allen Ginsberg's leadership there, and the Wallace Foundation. So uh, I, I couldn't have done it without that generous support. Thank you very much. I've had many wonderful colleagues and students, uh, many of whom are here today. Uh, I thank all of you, and especially uh, my colleague, uh, Laura Desimone, Uh, also, uh, I want to thank my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Joe Murphy. I didn't know it until later, but I understand that he uh, led the charge on my nomination. Uh, Joe, I wouldn't be here without you, that's for sure. And uh, I don't know who all wrote in my behalf, but I thank uh, all of uh, them as well. Uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, uh, Julian Stanley my mentor. I didn't even know what education research was when he recruited me to a doctoral program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So, uh, Julian, you're not with us today, but couldn't have done it without you either. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Joyce E. King. Let's give all those awardees another round of applause. So one of the privileges of being president is that you can give special recognition. And I have chosen to recognize Dr. Etta R. Hollins with a presidential citation. I just whispered to her, you know what story I'm gonna tell. And she said it's okay, so I have her permission to tell you. Etta published one of my first articles uh, back in the day, graduate students, when we were mimeographing. <laughs> Look that up in the dictionary. And she had a journal that she published by mimeograph, and she called me up and asked me if she could publish something that I had written, and I said, you wanna publish? something that I wrote, she said, yeah. I said, oh, I never thought anybody would, you know, the academic world would be interested in what I had to say. And she said, well, I'm going to change the academic world. And I said, well, I guess I'll just hold on to your skirt tails. <laughs> so, Etta, please. Thank you, Dr. King. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to be, be here today and to be able to uh, accept the accolades of a very close friend. Um, when I, I'm gonna tell a story on Joyce now, it's my turn. 
<clears throat> when I got my first appointment in higher ed, I got a card from Joyce. And on the card, it showed two African-American women in the cotton field. And I have kept that card because she was reminding me that the struggle had just begun. I want to thank Joyce for the many years of engaging in the struggle with me and for sharing the journey because it has been indeed a privilege. You know, we started on this journey when I was in, uh, an administrator in K-12 schools and we have continued this collaboration and support of each other's work. I, I, I also want to thank my mentors, um, especially Dr. James Banks at the University of Washington, Dr. Douglas Foley, who recently retired from the University of Texas at Austin, um, Dr. Johnny, Jones, Johnny Mills Jones, who was also at the University of Texas at Austin, and my long-term superintendent friend, uh, Dr. Warren Heyman. All of these people helped me to focus my work and to not forget what the work is about. This work is really about the children. It's really about making sure that all of the children have an opportunity to learn, to develop into competent, um, academic, uh, social, participating individuals. And in receiving this award, I ask myself, have I done enough? Have I been focused on the right issues? Have I made a difference in what the children can do? And I'm reminded whenever I read the NAEP scores, and especially the 2013 NAEP scores for 12th graders, that across this nation, only 38% of 12th graders reached proficiency in reading. Only 26% reached proficiency in mathematics. And if we look at the scores for underserved, underserved populations, we see that the situation is even more critical. And so while I'm grateful for the recognition for the work, I am reminded that the journey is still long and difficult. Thank you. The distinguished educator you will be able to celebrate next, Dr. Adelaide Sanford, has been queen mother to many of us, and it was most difficult to write this little tiny paragraph about her. But um, what I would like to say is when I was asked by AERA to lead the Commission on Research and Black Education Initiative, Dr. Sanford was the first person I went to for permission from an elder to do that work and for guidance. Dr. Sanford. So I want to give you, I want to give you your award after you speak. To all of those gathered here, those within my eye span and those all the way in the far reaches of this enormous room. I wish that I knew each of you personally, that I knew about your hopes and dreams and disappointments. I've heard a great deal about your work and I am in awe of it. I want to thank sister daughter, Dr. Joyce King, for having the courage to allow me to receive a citation at this distinguished group. I want to thank my grandmother and my grandfather who were enslaved people in this country by the laws of this country. 
and I knew them in my lifetime. I used to ask my grandmother, why did she want to live? Why didn't she run? Why didn't she slap old Miss and die? All of the questions of a naive child trying to put my frame of reference into her frame of reference. And she would look at me with quiet, soulful eyes and say, because of the hope that I had for what you would be, where you would go, what you would do, what you would say. And so I thank her for the memory of the responsibility and the mandate that she gave me. And I want to thank all of the parents who allowed me over 21 years to touch the lives of their children. Parents who for 15 years in that school had their children on a half day schedule so that they went into the middle school with a deficit, but it could not be recorded on their record card. So it was as though it was their fault that they did not know. And when we talk about the marginalization, the underserved, we have to look at those at the center who make the margins. We have to look at the overserved who make it sure that they will continue to be underserved people around whom we can have theories. And it was Peggy McIntosh at Wellesley College who talked about those who have the unearned advantages and those who have the unearned disadvantages. So when we look at the disadvantaged, we have to look at the overly advantaged. And you would think that after serving 21 years as a principal and that 21 years at the State Board of Education in the most powerful educational policy-making board in the United States, an elected board responsible for education from pre-kindergarten through postdoctoral studies, libraries, museums, archival material, 52 professions, public television, public radio. That's a part of the responsibilities of the New York State Board of Regents. And you would think after serving for 16 years as a regent at large, traveling across the state, and then as a vice chancellor for 14 years, that maybe I had moved from the margin to the center, no, I was still at the margin because those at the center had theories about the marginalized, but they didn't have the information and the will to bring the marginalized into a center that could be shared. So I'm grateful to sister daughter, Dr. Joyce King, for allowing me to say to you that unless we confront the fact that your marvelous research, there's no way to express the enormity of the influence that your research could have if it ever got to the people who make the policy. If they were required to know what you have found out, if they were required to know how you can bring all children to excellence, if they would be required to know that teachers who have been socialized to feel superior and entitled and have the unearned advantages are assigned to those who have not and know nothing about how to get them there. I apologize to the children at Rikers Island, which we are responsible for, and are there two and three and four years because their parents can't raise money to hire a lawyer or a legal aid lawyer to service them. For all of those of us who are parents and grandparents of sons in America today, who carry our hearts in our hands and our lives in the hands of those in the center, thank you for this opportunity. 
Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for your brilliance. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for your sacrifice. We must move this research into action so that the marginalized will have an opportunity to share the center. Thank you. This is also a special gift for Regent Sanford, and it's actually the creative production of Dr. Beverly Gordon, our program chair. And now I have a very special privilege to show my appreciation to Dr. Beverly Gordon, our program chair for this year's annual meeting, who also receives a presidential citation. Beverly. I know you are tired. You have been sitting for a long time. So I'm gonna tell you one quick thing. When Joyce first decided to run for president, I called her up and said, girl, if you get this, right, let me be the program chair, because we had worked together before. Right? Well, y'all, had I known then what I know now, <laughs> maybe I'd have gone fishing. But I decided to take this on. And I will tell all of you, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. For this reason, when Joyce and I decided that our theme was going to be toward justice, you need to understand, we got pushback. We were told that, how do you research justice? That's not quantifiable, right? What is that about? Now, being the sisters that we are, we said, go head on, we're going to do it anyway, right? <laughs> right? And this is the program that we have, right? We've heard from the Smithsonian, we've heard from Congress, even the NBA, hello, right? And I want to tell all of you, or say to all of you, I thank you. I thank Joyce, who has been a wonderful, wonderful girlfriend, mentor, colleague, for all these years. I thank my family, and I must say, to follow Andy, University of Wisconsin, I'm a badger. I know I work for a Buckeye, but I'm a badger, right? Right? <laughs> all right, don't ever. <laughs> and in closing, because like I said, I want this to be short, right? I want to say to all of you, or for the folks that are following as the future president and the program chairs, when you have an idea, you go for it. With that notion of just do it, I say, as Joyce and I used to say, we're gonna go head on with this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.